All right, so as was just mentioned, um, we're basically going to be doing the cyber necromancy talk. Um, going from there, obviously, I'm Matthew, uh, security technician, so basically application pen testing is what I do for my day job. And then, And I am Joseph. I am a security consultant with OActive, and I play Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, so as we're getting started here, I do want to give a couple warnings. This is not a development talk. We're not going to be getting into, you know, the actual programming, um, anything like that. It's not exploitation. Uh, we're not going to be talking about any, like, memory corruption exploits, anything like that. What we will be talking about, though, is just the cool project, or at least we think it's cool, of what we kind of spent our time doing over the last couple years, which was uh, through SaveMGO.com. Uh, basically, the idea is Metal Gear Online was a in my opinion, my favorite online game. I don't know how many of you are gamers or how many of you have played any online games, but this is one game that I had enjoyed. I spent a lot of time with it, and they only basically left it out for one year, which kind of sucks when you invest all that time, and then one year later, well, let's take it down and never play it again. Uh, There's no line play, anything like that, so we couldn't get it back online through that. Uh, there was a sequel to this game put out that was up for four years, I believe, and that game was also shut down again. No real option to play it. So the project itself is just bringing that server back up after the games were already shut down, which has a few kind of unique problems compared to the normal um, uh, private servers. Creating private servers, you normally have I, the PC game. I mean, uh, you've got... Um, what is it? Minecraft is a popular game, a lot of uh, private servers for that. Uh, and what you have with that is you're able to kind of look at the game server, look at what's going on, figure things out from that, and just kind of make your own connections from there. But in our case, we didn't have any server. We couldn't look at that. We couldn't look at the packets. We couldn't look at anything. All we had was the client to kind of work from, here's the client. Now, what's the server doing with any of this? Uh, so a couple other things is these were console games. So we've got the PS2, no real debugging features. I mean, you can't go set breakpoints on something and just look at what's going on. Can't look at the memory. Well, there were ways that we got around to look at the memory, but we'll get to those a little bit later. Um, with the PS3, uh, the game itself actually had an update where it removed the online mode from the game menu itself. So it wasn't exactly accessible from there either and ultimately ends up requiring a custom firmware. So at a high level, uh, the basic process is the same with any type of network if you're going to try and reproduce it. You're going to want to redirect traffic to your own machine. You're going to want to take the uh, known protocols and implement those and then implement your actual game protocol. I mean, that's just the high level. We'll go into a bit more detail with that. Okay, so you're going to change this. Uh, we'll start with traffic redirection. Um, uh, essentially, you have multiple ways of doing this. Uh, one would be patching, which uh, is an issue on consoles. It's not easy to patch a binary for the PS2 and hand it off to people. Um, you could maybe buy a domain, but is that legal? Like, is it is it possible to take over something? Does the original company still own it? Um, in our case, we went ahead and just went with a custom DNS. It's nothing new, but it works fine. So. Uh, the first protocol we took care of was the stun protocol, which is pretty basic. It's a non-issue. Uh, run your own stun daemon or point your DNS record to a public server. It's pretty much just what we did, and that takes care of everything. Uh, the next issue would be the DNAS. Or yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so DNAS was an issue just on the PS2. And this is basically where I spent a lot of time failing. Uh, what we basically have is DNAS, or the Dynamic Network Authentication System, is how Sony would detect cheaters um, if you're trying to get online using cheat codes or anything like that, modified disks. And it was also their piracy system. So making sure you had a legitimate disk in the machine at the time when you tried to go online. I spent a lot of time trying to kind of build this server up in a very pure way where a player could just take their original disk, pop it in the machine, enter our DNS information, and they'll just be able to play. That's what I tried to do. We didn't quite get to that point. I ended up failing quite a bit with that uh, for a few reasons, but um, 
in terms of trying to do things like that, Google's your friend. What we ended up finding was a leak of the Sony software development kit. So we're able to try and reference that, looking at the code, trying to find any exploits in there, things like that. And also, uh, there's documentation for the entire system that we can kind of reference. So it was useful, but ultimately, didn't really get to work with that. So like I said, there was a failure. Never managed to actually get past DNAS in this way. But what we did do is we had uh, some memory dumps. Uh, I mentioned earlier how we didn't have access on the console to memory dumps, but there was this emulator, uh, PCSX2, which emulates the PS2. So what we were able to do from that is when you would save the game, it would kind of save the emulator's memory in there. So we were able to kind of look at those dumps and use that to figure out some of the information. I mean, it wasn't an exact replica of what's on the PS2, but it was at least close enough for us to find some interesting pieces of memory. One of those pieces was the uh, new DNAS connect. It was just this random string sitting in memory. I'm not too sure why they'd have had that in there, but we're just looking through the memory, looking for anything that's going to be of interest, anything that might help us, and that's one of the strings that end up coming up. Uh, so from that, we find the string, you kind of follow it through, stepping through all the functions, all of the assembly in there, and we find a function that leads to it, just basically does a jump to another function, there you go. Uh, so the question that you have to ask there is what happens if you just return zero out of it, or minus one, or anything like that? What ended up happening for us was this was our bypass to get around this system. Uh, the system was basically blocking us from getting online because the game was closed, so it wouldn't even check the piracy stuff. It would just say, this game's closed, get out. So if we tried to return zero, it would actually let us bypass. But you kind of have an issue. You can't patch a disk. You can't you know, uh, press your own disk and send that out to everybody who wants to play. Or, well, you could, but we don't have that kind of money. Um, so one of the other issues, though, is the fact that it's packed binaries in there. So it's not a huge issue on, a, uh, on the uh, PCs because you can just kind of run the, mem or run the program, get to dump, or dump the memory after, you've, after it's been unpacked. But on the console, it's expecting everything to be on that disk, and you can't do a lot of those things. So what we ended up figuring out were cheat devices. I don't know how many of you have used any of the cheat devices like uh, Game Genie on like the NES or Game Sharks, things like that. But those things actually let you modify memory. I mean, when I was growing up, I mean, I saw those cheats and they're basically just magic to me. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, I just see these numbers and letters and it's like, whatever the heck that is, there it is. I don't know what this is, but What's cool about them is they actually make a lot of sense, and I just want to jump quickly into how these things work. This is one of the cheats that we used uh, to actually bypass the Sony's DNAS system. Uh, and basically what it is, is it's a really simple format where the first character indicates the type of code that's going on. So in our case, the C is a uh, conditional code. It checks if uh, 0x8 and then whatever your next seven letters are, characters, is equal to whatever's in the B slot. Um, and it would check that, and then if that condition passed, it would run all the next codes. So the two, which is an overwrite, uh, it would overwrite whatever's at 0x8, seven characters, with whatever you supply in B. So this would let us overwrite basically four bytes of memory at a time. Not a lot of memory, so we can't do some nice big map patching or anything like that. You've got to keep everything uh, really small but it does let you overwrite stuff. And there's a lot of codes. There's increments, decrements, pointers, copying out memory. There's a lot of stuff that you can do, but the two basic ones that we found that helped were the C and the two. So that was the main issue on the older console, the PS2. But for the PS3, uh, we looked at it was a little bit different. Um, you could essentially just get custom firmware on the system, then patch a binary, and I can just hand the binary off to everyone. Uh, the main thing that stopped us on the PS3 was the PSN service, uh, which is essentially used for your account, and also e-commerce, the store, and uh, DRM as well. So bypassing it was uh, pretty simple because we happen to have a leaked SDK, so we found this uh, function call which is basically loading up the PSN API. And what this does is it reads in a struct uh, 
And within that, there's a network type for different games on the PlayStation. So you have uh, Type 0, which is a network game, and Type 1, which is a network game with PSN access. And the difference is a net game, the steps are it will check if your uh, network device is enabled, check if the network's established, do you have an IP, and then it will continue execution. Uh, if it's a PSN type, it will then check has a PSN account ever been registered on this console, it stores it in Flash, so it checks Flash, and then says, okay, there was one, you need to authenticate to PSN, or you need to register. So in our case, we just change it to type zero on that struct. It's a very simple patch, it changes the net type, and then we just have to start going through the rest of the binary and find other uh, PSN API calls. In this case, we were really lucky because MGO2 did not really use PSN much, so there were two calls, one to grab your PSN uh, ID, and the other one to check if you're 18 or older for, I believe, chat restrictions. So we just went to the first call, patched that out, went to the second call and just modified it and made it so that everyone's always over 18. And that pretty much took care of everything. Uh, if we did not do that, the libraries were never loaded in memory, so it was just an older reference crash. Um, like I said, patching on the PS2 is really easy. Um, they're just self-binaries and um, I'll, I'll throw a link in later on in the slide deck, but there are some IDA scripts that somebody released, so you can easily unpack like all PS3 binaries, all PS3 libraries, and it will go through and find uh, pretty much all the SDK calls for you. So it was significantly easier than the situation on the PS2 where we were kind of in the dark. Um, the catch-22 is that it requires custom firmware. Since we are patching the binary, you need to run the unsigned code. So if you're running official firmware on a console, there's no way for you to play this. Uh, the next protocol that we have to take care of is standard HTTP. Uh, for the PS2, MGO, it's pretty simple, just user management, account management. Uh, for MGO2, it goes a little bit more, does version checks on which version of the game you're playing, as well as account management, and an in-game reward shop, where while you're playing, you can uh, get, I forget what they're called, player points or whatever, and you use that to purchase in-game items. Uh, it did not require real money, it was just in-game purchasing. So some, some I, I don't know, tricks or techniques that we used, uh, I mean, a lot of it was like basic guesswork. Um, if it's sending out a version check, just, okay, uh, what happens if we tell the client the response is zero, like, did that work? In our case, I believe it was null. If we sent a null, it worked fine. In other cases, we had to send hex 30, which is the ASCII zero, and that would work fine. And it was essentially just doing guesswork. Um, other things were, well, live debugging, we could go ahead and set breakpoints on useful functions, such as receiving a web response or URL decode if it was a request that had, uh, you know, parameters, and then start stepping through the code from that point. Um, what made it easier is we could easily modify the served files because we're the ones running the server and then find those strings in memory and go from there looking for the comparisons. And uh, for an example, I stuck a screenshot up there and that's just a little graph form on IDA and you could easily see that there's a large switch case at the bottom. So, you know, if you break on receive and start stepping through and you see a large switch case, those were all uh, did user's credentials match, succeed. If they did not match, error. If there's a session already there, error. If the user doesn't exist, error. And it was just all the different errors and that's how we moved on. Um, so examples of logic uh, when trying to figure this stuff out. You don't have to actually reverse engineer the entire client. You don't need to make sense of literally everything, such as all of those different errors, if a session existed, if not, all you have to do is in our back end, we created a database for credentials, and when somebody makes the request to authenticate, we just simply check if those credentials exist. If so, do a generic success, and the client will move on within the game. If not, we just send a generic error. Uh, the major issue with the PS3, I guess as well as PS2, is uh, SSL. Um, somehow, I don't know how, 
uh, Konami actually successfully did SSL surf pinning in the year 2007. In the year 2014, we still have to explain to people how to do it, but they did it right. Uh, unfortunately, since they did do it right, we can't easily bypass their SSL. We can't use our own certificates. We can't do anything like that. That is what is requiring our patch. Um, if in the future we were to find some sort of vulnerability in the SSL library or uh, in their native code, like uh, somewhere before the connections, we might be able to do some sort of jailbreak patch and people could start playing on official consoles. But at this time, we're stuck with SSL and just patching it on the binary and having to load that up on your PS3. All right, so this is uh, kind of where you start getting to, in my opinion, the more interesting stuff. All the old protocols, the HTTP, the stun, I mean, that's, that's your baseline. It's more or less boring, not all that interesting, kind of dry. But it does need to be done, so you have to kind of take a look at that. But when it comes to the protocol, in this case, the game has its own custom protocols. You pretty much expect any game is going to develop their own system to pass the data that they need passed along. So what we end up having is, or what's basically important with that is having packets. If you have the packets, as I mentioned, our server was down, so we couldn't look at the packets. We couldn't get a lot of that information. But if you have it, that's probably the most useful thing you can have. Uh, the more you have, basically, the easier this becomes. Because, I mean, when you just look at what's being sent here, this is what the PS2 would send our server. So we had enough to get to, to redirect the communication off to our server, but you just have hex. I mean, I don't know how many of you can just read hex like English, but I imagine most of you can't make too much sense out of this. I mean, for me, I can see that 41 up there. And, I mean, I know that's A. Beyond that, I'm not making too much out of this. So next step is to look at this in ASCII. Uh, if you look at this, I mean, there's, again, you can maybe make out the ZP there. I mean, that's kind of odd that you keep seeing that, and there's a Z at the beginning, but there's not a whole lot there. You're even looking at this in that case. It's like you see that ZP, ZP all the time, but you don't see a whole lot else. So, you know, for your sake, we didn't have this, but maybe a larger packet might help. Is anyone figuring out what's going on yet? Uh, probably not, but... Um, the other thing that you can kind of notice is that there were uh, no null bytes in here, no zero zeros. And I mean, sometimes you'll see that, sometimes you won't, but you kind of look through this, and I mean, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but uh, once you've kind of looked at, this, looked at this for a while, you start noticing more patterns. There are obviously the 5A, 70. You see these things always showing up in the same columns. Um, it's always so many bytes out, so you keep looking there. There's like the 85 seems to show up after that 70 and things like that. So if you keep looking at this long enough, you eventually start figuring out little details, but you see more and more of the same. Uh, but the key things being there's no null bytes in there, and you see this four byte, the dot dot ZP coming up a lot. So if you've encountered this before, you might already know what comes next. But basically, they were just XORing the pack with a four byte key. So pretty trivial to get around. But if you haven't seen that before, I mean, you're not really going to know what's going on. With you, a hard-coded key. Yes, it was a hard-coded key that they actually used over both games. The Metal Gear Online 1 they released in 2006. Um, and they used the same key again back in 2008 when they released the second online version. Um, and they actually followed this through for a number of their other games with uh, that four-byte hard-coded key in there. Uh, so basically, now, if you're going to walk away with one thing that's going to save time in the future, I don't know how many of you guys deal with reversing protocols, but seeing the XOR and seeing those things is basically your dead giveaway for they're using XOR over it, not any type of crazy encryption. So once you've uh, decrypted, or at least decoded that XOR bit, um, you basically see this pack. This is the larger pack that we're showing, and what this is is the lobby listing for a server. So as a player would connect, they'd go through the stun, the HTTP, user authentication, and they'd come to this thing, which just lists out the lobby. So at this point, if you're trying to figure out what the server needs to send back, and fortunately, we did end up getting a player who sent us a small packet capture that contained a few requests that helped us out. This is one of the packets that he had sent us. So 
we were able to reference this packet as we were trying to figure out how the server is going to respond to things. Uh, but yeah, basically, this is your lobby list. I am going to work through this later and look at the actual uh, content of that. But for now, if we're just looking at the protocol, you basically got this. These are all our packets. It said, looking at the packets, you're going to want to look at them and just compare. See, these are all decoded packets, so there's no XOR over this. This is exactly what's being sent. And if you look at those, there's some numbers that should possibly stand out as you look at this long enough. Or some being this, going one, two, three, four, five, one, two, and all that. Uh, we basically figured out this is a sequence number at that point. So, I mean, you've got kind of a header there, and that's your sequence number in there. The next one that stood out is this by our... And every time the payload got larger, you'd notice that number would also be larger. I twinning, and then you've got a large payload in there. Next thing is your command. So every new command that would be sent, if you want a lobby listing, it would send uh, 2002, I believe it was. And the server would send back 2003. Like that. So you start noticing those numbers out there. You're able to work through from that. And then I already mentioned the payload comes in under that. You notice the smallest packet is always uh, those first few bytes, and then you've got the optional payload in there. But there's still some that isn't quite explained. There's these bytes, which you look at those, there's no real pattern to them. So the question that you kind of need to ask when you start running into random things uh, in network protocols is, what else is random that isn't random? Uh, the first thing I always jump to is prime numbers. Um, I always think, you know, the difference between prime numbers, there's kind of the random distribution of it. Of course, that has nothing to do with this, but my first thought's always prime numbers. What's going on here? If we just bring those out, these might look a little bit more familiar. Take a look at that. You've got basically your MD5 of the payload and uh, the header area which ultimately gives us then the header of eight bytes, command, payload length, sequence, hash, and the payload in there. Which now leads us into actually reversing the payloads themselves. Um, the ideal way, what are you doing? Sorry. Uh, the ideal way is if you have the packet captures. Um, gain. I keep bringing this up, packet captures. If you can get packet captures of your game while it's still up, or if whatever you're going to work on. Um, I mean, we, we're focusing in on a game, but this is true for basically any type of network service. If you can get the packet captures, that helps a lot. It's just a matter of replaying and experimentation. So if we take a look at this, this is the uh, lobby listing request that we saw earlier. You've got, in red, you've got the uh, command codes being sent out, the one, two, and three, what was interesting was that the server, or the client, the PS2, would send like a 20X, or 0x21, and the server's response would be 22, or 23. It would be like one number up. So that was one pattern that we were able to kind of notice in there. And then you'll notice that the sequence there, 0, 1 from the client, the client's sending the first pack and the server sends the bottom two. Um, they have separate sequences, so they both sent one, they both sent two on their second packets basically their own independent sequence. But let's start looking in at that payload. Um, since I had played the game, I kind of know these are the lobby listings. I mean, I recognize things like Liquid and Snake in there and things like that. If we format it out, you kind of see that's in roughly 45 byte groups. If you want to count those out, go ahead. Uh, you can kind of notice the name always seems to be uh, 15 bytes plus a null in between. And you've got uh, the IP, which is also 15 bytes with a null, or plus a null. You've got the CDEEF, which we were able to recognize just from kind of being there to recognize that the port number is coming right after the IP, which makes sense. Uh, but you've got kind of the first eight and the last four bytes. I'll bring those up in the hex now. You'll notice you've got the first four bytes there, it's just zero, one, two, three, four, just counting through there. And to be honest, we never actually figured out what these mean. It seems like it's just an identifier and that's it. Uh, but changing them to any value basically made no difference in the game. So we kind of kept with our standard of 
incrementing each row, but we never actually found them being used anywhere. This one's a little bit more weird, though. It goes 0, 1, 2, 2, 2, uh, which if you look at these, you've got a gate, a count. So the gate is 0, a count's 1, and then 2, 2, 2 are the three actual player rooms. So looking at those, we're able to kind of figure out that perhaps that's a type identifier. So if we give it a, if we say something's of type zero, it's where the account management's going to be done, the account authentication, things like that. If we give it the one, or sorry, I guess the zero is where the gate's going to be. So kind of organizing where different servers are located. And two was our game lobby. So if we basically just take that, looking at it, and try a few different values in there, uh, we can actually see that replayed. I'll show that in a little bit. Uh, the next set, though, is this uh, 1, 2, and then jumps immediately to A, B, C, so to 10, 11, 12, which kind of threw us a little bit. It's like, this seems like, again, it's kind of a identifier going in there. Um, the, the packet itself is a little bit larger, and there's A, B, C, D, E, F, 10, 11, 12 going in through there. But what we have right now, just for this sake, is showing those three. Uh, and what it seems to be is that every lobby had their own kind of international ID. Uh, the J Japanese basically had uh, 0, 1 through 0, 9. So we were able to kind of figure that out by looking at what the other countries had in their lobbies, or by guessing at least. Next set are these numbers. Uh, the only one that really stands out, obviously, is the 9E, which... Ultimately, if we just play around with what numbers might be, uh, so one of the things that you can do, if you get some that is reflected, in this case, lobby listing is going to be reflected out to uh, the users. You're playing on the server as you're trying to get on there. You're going to see this reflected out, so we can easily just modify values, sending a bunch of A's, changing the IPs, and sending A, B, C, D for that unknown value. You can just kind of send that out and see what happens on the game. So this is a screenshot from the game itself where you see A's reflected out, 67, 68, 69 players. So that, of course, reflects our CDE. Uh, so, I mean, that's kind of the easy way. I mean, if you have the packets, if you have all of that, that's the easy way. You can just plug in the values and see what happens. Uh, the harder way is if you don't have uh, that packet capture. Uh, one of the things that you can kind of start looking for is, is there no instruction from what's being sent by the client? Because often the client's going to be following the same protocol and kind of the same setup as the server will. So, you know, you could look for XML, JSON, SOAP, or is it custom? In our case, it was a custom setup. Uh, the other thing to pay attention to is any type of crypto being used. Uh, this could be a talk on its own, trying to figure out what type of crypto is being used and things of that nature. So, I'm not going to jump into that, but I do have a link in the slides, which covers it quite well. So in our case, of course, there's no known format. We're just kind of dealing with our own setup. But what we did figure out was that the first four bytes would normally end up uh, supplying some type of error code. So if we wanted to error the server out, just give a generic error. We give it anything that's non-zero. And the other thing that we were able to kind of look at packets and figure out is that the uh, server command is usually that plus one. I mentioned that earlier, how one area will send the 0x2002, and then the next server response will give 0x2003. So we're able to kind of use that to our advantage, look at what the patterns are in other places of the code. So again, experimentation comes down to being, of course, useful. Uh, the first four bytes, as I mentioned, are kind of that error code. So sending zero to everything meant it's all successful. Everything's good. It just kind of moves along. At least in a lot of cases, that would happen. Uh, and the error would only be displayed if and only if uh, you had the right command. So in some places where the command ID was not uh, the plus one, so there's one area where the server sends like 41, 32, and the uh, or sorry, the client sends that, and the server's response is like 2008. So in that case, it's not plus one. We didn't know that at the time. So what we found you could do, in this case, we can kind of exploit that error message by just sending 
you know, a thousand packets out to the client and being like just plus winding all the way through until eventually we see this error pop up from the one that it's actually parsing. And that's how we're able to figure things out. And I mean, a lot of protocols have something similar where if you send it a malform command, it's just going to ignore it so you can have the error come up somewhere else. So we found that to be rather useful. Um, yeah, I just explained this. So determining the payload, this is mentioned kind of for the HTTP stuff, but it also happened here where the first thing you want to try to do is guesswork. I mean, your normal case is you're uh, sending a blank, just nothing in there, not a null byte, just completely blank payload, which we found worked in the user settings area of this game. Sending a null would work to create a game. Uh, sending ASCII zero, seeing the HTTP stuff. And sending a bunch of zeros, which was the success code we mentioned earlier, would work. But in most places, it would just be kind of garbage data. It would uh, assume that you had sent everything. So it would try reading basically memory that you didn't write or memory that, that you didn't send. And the other reason why that works is because most of the time a client will have a default route even if the data is garbage. So in this case, the user settings, we can send a blank payload, so it did not get any user settings from us. So it just goes, okay, we'll give you default, and you'll see some more examples of that later. So we did fake, try faking success for a lot of things. Like, at one point I had the server basically just sitting there, and if it got a packet that it didn't know, didn't understand, it's just gonna send a success code back with plus one, we see if that worked, and that actually, surprisingly got us through a lot of functionality. But as I mentioned, you kind of run into that problem where you're not really handling the functionality. Like the user settings, when the user wants to save them, we can send zero and say that we successfully saved them, but we didn't save their settings. We just told the, server, or told the client that we did. So that's not going to be very useful. So then you have to start looking at uh, basically what goes on behind it, trying to implement the actual functionality. Even though you get the success, you still need to implement some parts of it. Are you going to do this? Okay. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, we had user settings where no error was happening. So we can get through this without having an error come off, but we can't, or we still need to actually deal with this functionality. So it's basically not useful unless we actually implement everything else. So user setting example, and this is what it sent us. Uh, 4110 was the command code, um, and it just sent us this big blob of data, uh, which we were just saying, hey, we successfully dealt with and ignored it. Uh, so basically, this is just kind of where the tedious stuff comes in. If you're able, again, this is kind of like the same idea with the first packet where you're sending data to see how it's reflected. What you do in this case is change the client to send different data and see how that gets reflected. So in our case, we basically just replace the uh, rotation speeds and the different speeds in there, they go zero to 10. Just replace those and then saw how they were reflected in the actual payload that came back. And that's kind of common sense, you know, look at what's there and just go through everything one by one until you eventually figure out what everything does and where everything's uh, being reflected. So in this case, it was just a giant bit field and everything's kind of just modifying one bit or a few bits from within that, a byte sometimes. Uh, so it's just kind of really tedious work in that area. Yeah, and there were a couple, I mean, when you're dealing with the client, there's a lot of uh, enumeration and mapping out data like that. So in this case, those in-game items from that gear shop I was talking about earlier. Uh, this is a packet that was, uh, it was in one of the packet captures that somebody sent us and it was basically telling the server, these are the items that I own. And we just started looking at it. In this case, the uh, first one happened to be the amount. Uh, I truncated the packet, but there were 24 different areas. So you just assume that's the amount of items. Then there seemed to be an ascending by and then a couple bytes after that that had various uh, differences. And at that point, we were able to realize that uh, the initial byte was the item ID, and then after that, they were color codes. So we just started sending them to the uh, server, sending a successful response, and then seeing what the client would actually load up. In this case, we sent uh, zero items, nothing came up. 
went ahead and increased it to one, an item came up and we just had the 11 item ID. And then we started manipulating the bytes after that. And that's when you started seeing extra colors available for that item. And like you said with the settings, this is not difficult, it's not technical, it's just tedious and it takes some time. But you're able to just start mapping out internal stuff within the game. And uh, the way this works is the, the, the client has access to do everything, it's just checking with the server if it's allowed to basically load those files. So uh, what was interesting is this game offered DLC years later and the DLC had extra map and extra items, but it turned out all that stuff was actually in version 1.0 and they just slowly unlocked it, which was kind of a dick move. And you could unlock all the items just with these requests as we're mapping out. So in this case, we told it that we did not have uh, any items for our body and it just gives us a, a stock like jacket that's like a placeholder. And then as we started going through like, oh, here's a t-shirt and then moving through colors and we ended up being able to map everything out until we got to something like this, which is this crazy Japanese wrestler mask. Um, and this is uh, completely non-public. We were assuming it was like a dev item or a special thing. Um, it was unreleased and it was kind of interesting because we started um, finding dev items uh, such as t-shirts or jackets which just strange textures that were mapping out dimensions, um, I'm assuming for the artist to to do the right sizes and, um, and other hidden items as well as uh, the company hosted a massive global tournament and there was like a best player in the world and he got this special outfit. Well, now I have that outfit, ha. Huh. So, so yeah, slow and tedious. Yeah, so, I mean, we've covered some of the basic cases where you have to do these tedious things to just kind of, you know, change a bite, see how it's reflected, things like that. But sometimes you get a little bit more complicated payloads that you can't just guess at, you can't just send, you know, a bunch of A's out. Oh, you can actually, but. Uh, you, basically, it takes a little bit more work to get into that. I'm going to kind of zoom through this, but uh, with the friends list, we exhausted all of our simple case. We tried the no, we tried some of those things, and all we got was an error message coming back. Uh, these are what their error messages look like. It's basically just an error occurred and a number. The number is, the number would basically reflect that first four bytes that we saw, so that's how we'd be able to track things when we saw this error. Uh, but the friends list, uh, when we're trying to figure this out, the other thing that we started looking at is what did some of the other packets end up looking like? Uh, what were some of the other structures? What were some of the themes that we saw in some of these packets? So something that we ended up noticing was you had client updates, which were like that uh, user settings. It would just push it out and expect a very minimal response. There would be client requests, which are the client actually requesting data, like requesting that lobby listing. And then there would be lists where it would actually supply like a list of information. So the game listing would be something like that. Uh, so the friends list, I kind of figured, hey, this is probably a list. So let's actually try and implement this as a list. So the list uh, basically would send an empty packet, a packet containing the list, and then it, uh, an empty packet at the end signifying we're done. So I just made a random attempt there to send out the 0x4580 as the empty packet sent a empty 81 and then sent uh, 83. Um, that was one of the patterns that we noticed in some cases. It wasn't always incremental. Sometimes it would jump by two, especially when it came to the list. Yeah, just to clarify, uh, what that's actually doing is between those commands, uh, such as like player stats, it's sending a command to the server, hey, I'm going to send you player stats. The server sends back, okay, um, expecting stats. Then you send all the, the list of data, and then you send another command saying, I'm done sending the data, and then it confirms. Yeah, so we were able to kind of look at what the client's sending and hope that maybe if we do that from the server, it'll work the same way. So in our case, it did actually work the same way. We had the friends list come up, it was empty as I sent empty data, but it did work that way. Uh, so we were able to try a few different things in there. Uh, we were able to send uh, like 82 out there and I just sent 100 A's just to see what would be reflected. So once we kind of figured this out, we were able to get back to just everything's reflected out so we can just take a look. So in this case, had friends listed as A. 
So change the string there to see what's actually being reflected. I'll figure out what bytes are being used here. Uh, just using a long location string there. And you notice it starts at C0, so obviously A0 and B0 have to represent something else. Um, they're kind of missing there, and there's also missing uh, 42 bytes between that J0 and F1. So we know there's this gap in there, so you're able to just kind of look at the reflection, figure things out. Uh, if you go and choose one of those friends and do the player stats, it sends its request with the ID 41, 30, 42, 30, so that's A0, B0, so that's that missing four bytes at the start. So we figured out that much, but you still have that 38 bytes kind of missing in there. Turns out there's another functionality kind of hidden deep within the game that reflected a lot more data, so you see what game your friends are in, you see what lobby they're in, the game ID. And you're basically just able to work out by using the functionality to see what ends up going where. Uh, what got difficult here, and this is where we were basically stuck for the longest time working on the server, was actually joining a game. We were able to create games, we were able to do user settings, we were able to do game listing, but we couldn't actually join a game. You can kind of run around alone in a game for a while. That got boring after a few months. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing similar in this case. Yeah, and the reason that's working is, once again, just like with the gear, uh, we're just telling the client anything. So when the client's like, hey, I want to join a game, we just tell, yeah, you did. Like, you did create that game, and somebody just joined too. And so the client's just like, okay, cool, and it loads the map. But even though there might be, like, no network activity, nothing else going on, you're just tricking the system to just execute other parts of the code, and they just didn't do any sort of validation. Right, so obviously looking at the join game, there were a number of steps there. Obviously you have your game, you're going to try and join it. Step one was having the game data. It would request this 4313. So if you take a look back there, it had host info. We noticed that it was the same request. When you tried to join a game, it sent a host info request. So we're able to look at what the data was there, figure things out just like we have in the past. Step two was player stats. Uh, you know. Again, we saw, if you look at the actual players there, you can make a player stats request. It's pretty much the same thing as that. But what we end up needing to do here is starting to get more you know, static analysis. So we've exhausted all the easy things, but we have um, kind of this last packet coming out, the 4103 was, we had no idea what was in this packet. It had done player stats requests, it had done all this other stuff, and now it's asking for something else, and we don't know what to do with this. Uh, so what we kind of had to start jumping into was looking at the code path. So jumping in there and looking for nearby strings, magic number. In our case, it was 4103. That was our command. So searching the code for that. And what we ended up doing was finding the XOR code, that static key in memory. We just kind of stood with that and worked our way through all the disassemb disassembly until we reached something that looked like our code. So you can see the 4104, 05, 03 in there and basically just starts jumping through that memory until we find the function call that actually handles what we want. Find the function call, and like before, we just did a return zero from it, which ended up being how we patched it out. Uh, it is a more complicated payload that we've started making progress on, but at this point, it's still being patched out in the game, which is, uh, you can just kind of use a knob to patch it out. But your other option is to actually look at the disassembly and figure out what bytes would make this pass. Uh, so we had looked at a bunch of different things. Uh, basically, we patched that out, as I mentioned, so we moved on to a new packet. Again, no idea what's coming up in this packet. Well, just to clarify, if you go back, uh, what we patched out were just the stats. Um, go back a slide. So when you go to join a game, the first payload is requesting the game information, the next payload is requesting player information, and then stats. We just have never figured out, we haven't finished figuring out the stats, so that's what we patch out, and then now it continues on to the next step, but this is all within the same process of trying to join a game. Yeah, so one of the things that also comes useful, I've mentioned the Sony SAK being leaked. Another thing was just looking at other resources. So Google is your friend. I spent a lot of time just looking to see if anybody had dealt with the Konami protocol. So I noticed this was used on MGO2, MGO1. It's used on uh, Pro Evolution Soccer. Uh, and we ended up finding this packet in Metal Gear Online 2. It was a little bit different, 
but basically it was uh, just sending the IP of the host. So it said, here's your IP to connect to, because the gameplay itself takes place over UDP, just kind of peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Uh, so we found that, and the client unexpectedly would send this 4340 before you actually join the game. It's like, here's a new packet. Um, sorry, the host of the game would send this packet out. Not really too sure what to do with that. Um, and there was no error message from this because what would happen was the player would connect to the host, the host would connect to the server making this request. So if we sent an error out, it would reach the host, and then the host would just stop responding to the player. It wouldn't bother showing any type of error message, so we weren't able to use that to kind of help us out. Uh, but the content of this, as we looked at, was the joining player ID. So you know it's something like asking, is this player allowed to get in there, or something like that. Again, we kind of started looking through the disassembly, we found the command code in there, and then we found a branch where you kind of follow that through found the handler in memory, and what I ended up being not or what I end up noticing is that the function makes a lot of calls, but it never checks the return value. Um, it reads four bytes out of the packet, but never really checks things. So the structure basically ended up being a success code, and then you send the player ID back. It ended up checking if um, the player ID matched the uh, sent ID. So that let us have basically the first game in six years on that game. I guess uh, we probably should have put it in one slide at the end, but just to clarify, during that join game, uh, the main issue we were having is throughout the, the earlier concepts, we were just tricking the client into doing things. In this case, you were dealing with multiple clients communicating to the server. So player one would communicate with the gate and say, I wanna join server, which is player two. Player two would then ask the gate, hey, who is this guy? Here's his player ID. It would then ask him for his info, he would tell it, and then it would come back and say, that's cool. So our issue was having the server tell the next player that it's okay for him to join. So that's why the host was just always ignoring us for like 15 packets. It would just be like, are you sure, are you sure, are you sure? Nah, screw you. And it would just stop. Yeah, so I mean, that's a high level view of, kind of what we dealt with with this. A uh, couple more things, if you try and do this. Um, it is a lot more work than what we show up here. I mean, the XOR thing, it's like I can show that in just a few minutes, but that was really quite a bit longer. I won't say how long. Uh, overall, the actual work on this took us about 10 months of kind of off and on work, and we just jumped through it in about an hour. And there are some really crazy people out there, uh, especially as you kind of get closer and closer to finishing a server. You start getting, one, you get the people just complaining that you're not done yet. But two, you have the people saying, well, it's not out yet, or you haven't given me exactly what I want. Therefore, I'm going to go and, you know, tell Sony on you or something like that. So we had one guy, you know, threatening all this legal action, things like that. Uh, then, of course, you have to deal or be concerned with copyright, DMCA in the U.S., um, since we were running the server in the U.S. Uh, there are um, exceptions for this, uh, but I won't really jump into too much with that. And I do want to give a quick shout on some credits here too. I mean, we work on this, but there were a few other people that have helped us. Uh, Derek is one of the other developers who's involved with both game servers. Um, Zach kind of got us started in the beginning, did some of the groundbreaking, some of that XOR work. Um, and he did a Resident Evil server. Um, so there's another game, if you play Resident Evil, there's an online mode for that. That's another PS2 game that's come back, that came back online a few months after us. Uh, Halston, uh, he did the Pro Evolution soccer server on the PC. Uh, he was basically, I just kind of messaged him on Twitter and I'm like, hey, you did some of this, can you help me out? And I was able to bounce a few ideas off him and got a lot of help out of that. Uh, what the fuck are you thinking? Again, he was involved with some of our development, and Jay has been doing a lot of kind of like file work for us. I was just going to uh, add in like with the crazy people and product stuff because I forget if we actually did a slide on why we're giving this talk. Uh, the reason was because so many people reached out to us asking how we did it and how could they uh, revive some of their favorite games. and. Um, and that's pretty much what led to this. Uh, I think it started in like Reddit, but then it led to this talk.
uh, one of the issues uh, with the crazy people we were talking about is that for months you're actually dealing with people reaching out to you, bothering you every day, saying like, why aren't you putting this up for me yet? Like, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you that? As if it's like a decision that we're making. Um, so if you decide to ever do something like this, just be prepared. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to mention were uh, the link to those uh, IDA scripts uh, that were really useful for the PS3. Um, unlike the PS2, if you actually decide to start hacking on a PS3 game and reviving a PS3 game, there's a leaked SDK <coughs> and a leaked debugger, and you can find those, and it makes your life way, 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 way easier. Uh, and you can just run with it from there. All right, so our time's basically up here, but if you guys have any questions, uh, we'll probably be around for a bit. And yeah, that's our presentation. <laughs>